Hey all, here are OS Reviews. Today we're taking a closer look at a pretty interesting Android smartphone. It's the Sharp Aquos R6. This phone debuted in 2021, so it's not the newest on the market anymore, but I think the hardware is interesting enough to warrant a revisited look. So Sharp is a brand that we don't really associate with making smartphones. They're more well known for TVs and displays. Although they did come out with the Aquos Crystal that gained a bit of headlines back in 2015 for really kicking off the bezel-less trend on smartphone design. Although they've been mostly quiet on the global scene since then, they have still continued to make smartphones in native Japan, and the R6 is one such example. And the R6 really kicked off the recent trend of 1-inch camera sensors becoming more popular on flagship smartphones. So a larger sensor size allows the camera to collect more light, meaning low-light performance should be better, in addition to having more natural depth of field, aka bokeh. Not to mention the optics here are crafted via collaboration with Leica after their partnership with Huawei ended. And through this collaboration, Leica also made their own branded version called the Lights Phone 1 and 2, which are manufactured by Sharp. It's essentially the same phone as the R6 when it comes to specs, but just having a little bit different styling. Although interestingly enough, it doesn't seem to be an exclusive partnership because in recent months we've also seen Leica partner with Xiaomi on some of their flagship smartphones as well. And the impressive hardware was further coupled by a time-of-flight sensor for capturing even better portrait effects. That being said, there was no ultra-wide angle lens, nor is there a telephoto zoom lens available on the R6. So it's really counting on that main sensor to do all the heavy lifting, similar approach to older Pixel phones, but you don't get quite as much versatility as a result. Now of course the phone being a previous flagship is very well constructed with Gorilla Glass on the front and the back, coupled with aluminum rails that are slightly tapered and flattened on the edges give it a bit more of character. Even though there's a bit of a hump caused by the camera sensor, but it still doesn't really wobble when you're setting it down on a table. The bottom here also houses a 3.5mm headphone jack, which is incredibly rare to find in this day and age, USB Type-C, and also stereo speakers, one at the bottom and one at the top, earpiece serves as the second one. And charging up the 5000 mAh capacity battery, rather large, it takes around 2 hours or so using the 33 watt charging speed, although there is no Qi wireless charging available. And located on the right-hand spine are all the buttons, including a power key, which is slightly textured, and there's also a Google Assistant button in addition to a volume rocker, which I do feel is placed maybe just a little bit too high, and considering that this is a rather large phone with a 6.7-inch display, I do think that some of the buttons are a little on the smaller side, to be completely honest, but at least they are made out of metal and feel pretty tactile when you're pressing on them. And on the front, we're graded to a gorgeous 2K resolution OLED display, which has ultra-fast 240Hz refresh rate that can dynamically scale down to just 1Hz to conserve on battery, depending on what application you're using. Again, with Sharp being mostly known for making TVs and displays, it's not surprising to see such a high-quality panel on their flagship smartphone. The screen here is also curved on the edges, both the left and the right side. In fact, it's a pretty dramatic curve. On the plus side, it does make the bezels look even smaller. That being said, I do find that the curve might be a little bit too steep on this particular phone, and downsides being that I sometimes did find myself getting some accidental touches as I'm gripping the sides of the device, although again it is otherwise a gorgeous screen, though in terms of practicality I do sometimes prefer having a flat screen that gets rid of the possibility of accidental triggers. There is otherwise a 12 megapixel front facing camera and a year piece on the very top. Now underneath the hood we are talking about also flagship specs from yesteryear including the Qualcomm Snapdragon 888 processor that's coupled with 12 gigabytes of RAM and 128 gigs of built-in storage by default. So as expected, system navigation and performance remains pretty fluid and fast. Now one other interesting feature on the R6 is the fingerprint scanner underneath the display is 50% larger than on most other smartphones. It means that you don't have to necessarily only hold it in a single circular region, but you can be a little bit more liberal in terms of how you're placing your finger and it will still unlock. In fact, for extra security, you can even scan two fingers at once to unlock the device if you are really paranoid about security. And I have to admit that this is one hardware feature I wish more smartphones would adopt. It does make the phone feel faster and easier to unlock. Otherwise, we are talking about a nearly stock version of Android 11 by default from Sharp, so there's not too much bloatware going on. For example, there's access to the conventional Google feed on the left, as well as all the standard Google apps. You will find a handful of carrier exclusives from Docomo, which is the Japanese carrier that the R6 was sold in. However, these can thankfully be mostly uninstalled or disabled. So really, it's not an obtrusive software experience at all, aside from some minor additions from Sharp, including a pedometer, which you can also see on the main homepage that tells you a number of steps that you've walked. 
Advanced display settings also allow you to upscale normal videos into HDR as you're watching it to make it more contrast rich. You can also choose which applications to take advantage of the ultra fast refresh rate. So it looks like you aren't able to dial it down to 120 or 90 hertz manually, but rather if it's on, it will always be dynamic and adjusting by itself. Now, one downside of OLED screens in general, it's not unique to only the R6, is there is a higher chance of screen burn-in, which is the case on this particular used unit. You see a little bit of a residue or shadow imprinted after it was left on that screen for too long at too high of a screen brightness level. So that is one thing to consider and also watch out for if you're shopping for a used model like this, but again, not unique to only the R6 and obviously will depend on the condition of the phone that you are getting. Now, when it comes to pricing, the R6, if you are located in Asia can often be found for around $200 used. So that puts it into the budget territory. But in other locales, such as in, say, the US, where it's not going to be quite as common to see this phone in the first place since it was never officially launched here, it might be harder to come across. That being said, in international markets, again, this is now at a fairly budget oriented price bracket. It's actually quite similar in terms of situation to the revisited look on the Pixel 6 that we did a couple of months ago, but this is a phone that is much more common here in the States and is similarly can now be found at around 200 bucks or so easily when shopping around. And the R6 is kind of the equivalent of the Pixel in certain markets like Japan, for example. It's a very similar scenario in terms of the degradation from the original MRSP, which was once over a grand, retention of value doesn't seem to be the strongest suit of Sharp in general, since their reputation isn't as grounded as, say, Apple or even Samsung, and hence why we see a pretty dramatic drop in price later on. But this is great for consumers, of course, that want more of a value-oriented device or a way to explore something new. Now, there's other advanced features, including auto-scroll, and here's one such example of flicking upwards. You can change the speed to be faster or slower, and it will just continue to scroll along without you having to physically continue to swipe if you're reading back a longer article, for instance, and of course you can just tap once to stop. A few other highlights include a gaming mode, which will block incoming notifications and boost the CPU and GPU when you're gaming. Long holding the power key can also be used to trigger a shortcut of your choice from any application installed on your phone. So it's a remappable shortcut key, just like on the newest iPhones. And also there is intelligent charging just like on Pixel devices. So it will only charge itself back up to say 90% to prolong the battery's endurance and life. Closer look at the camera UI, we can activate Google Lens instantly to scan a barcode or recognize an object. You can also change it from taking portraits as well as close-ups and landscape shots. It slightly crops the image, but it's all done digitally there because there's only one camera lens on the rear. There's also an AI scene detection that will automatically change it from, say, a night mode versus, again, capturing a portrait or food or close-up documents by itself, adjusting some of the properties. Then down below, we have just a slider for things like recording video, time-lapse footage, as well as a dedicated night mode and also a dedicated portrait mode as well. And video does capture up to 4K 60fps. And overall results are quite good. At 20 megapixels, there's enough detail for you to zoom in and crop and still retain plenty of information in your shots. Colors are also more on the accurate or neutral side, I would say. It's not overly saturated. Also, the natural bokeh does give you a pretty convincing DSLR effect because of the larger sensor size in here. Everything just slowly kind of drops off there in the background, even if you're not shooting in the portrait mode. So we get generally pleasing results. The problem though is that it does take a little bit longer than I would like for it to process the images. After snapping on the shutter key, it can often take an extra second or two longer for it to process and render. So shutter speed is not quite as ideal. In addition, Processing in more challenging lighting environments, even though it does have an okay night mode, I would say is still a little bit behind what the algorithms on Google Pixels, as well as the latest iPhones can deliver. Just pulling in even more light using computational photography, which is an area that isn't quite as sophisticated on the Sharp Aquos devices, because the majority of this company's budget is probably spent on developing the best display possible, one such example can be seen in this image of a fruit that I'm holding in this hallway, but the skin tone is much darker than what it should be, and some of the details are a little bit muddy. And so the overall results are just not as consistent as I would like, especially if you aren't in perfect lighting conditions. In essence, it is a good camera, it's just not the best camera, which some might have expected. Looking at the specs alone, as well as that Leica branding, so it really goes to show that, again, software is an integral part of smartphone photography in this day and age. But overall, still a decent shooter. And now a quick demo of the audio performance and what video consumption looks like on the Aquos R6.
So turning down the volume there, some takeaways being that it is, again, a beautiful display in terms of colors, super vibrant with the HDR10 upscaling, as well as the inky contrast, make it a great experience for YouTube, Netflix, any media that you're watching. Now, the stereo speakers also do function, giving you some decent separation as you're holding the phone in this landscape mode, but unfortunately, it is quite mediocre. Volume output is generally not a problem, but I just find it to be a little on the muffled side for lack of a better expression. In some cases, even sounding a little tinny and distorted, so by no means is it the best sounding speaker on a smartphone. It definitely works, but I definitely appreciate the presence of a headphone jack, and you can always use wireless headphones or speakers to further improve on that situation. On the plus side, connectivity at least is quite good in terms of loading speeds with dual band 2.4G and 5G Wi-Fi, in addition to the 888 does support 5 G cellular as well. So having a fast enough internet connection to load back videos without really buffering is something that you can count on. And that's a similar case with web browsing as well. It's a, again, extremely sharp panel at 2K resolution, great contrast, and very fast refresh rate makes it a joy for reading back articles. It's also neat to see a glove mode to increase the screen's sensitivity if you're using it in winter times, as well as a auto caption function, or really live caption, which was once a Pixel exclusive, also become available on R6 and other stock Android devices. So if you're watching any video, even without subtitles by default, the phone will still provide a translation of it using machine learning. It also goes without saying that as a flagship Japanese smartphone, it has full IP rating for water resistance, and connectivity is fully stacked. Aside from 5G, there is built-in Bluetooth, NFC, GPS that all function. Now, one aspect of the R6 that surprised me was the thermals, and unfortunately not in a fantastic way, and that is because, admittedly, I haven't tested out many Snapdragon 888 phones. We've either been revisiting older devices that are using the Snapdragon 855, 865, or newer phones with 8 Gen 1. So the 888, in retrospect, definitely was not the most thermally efficient chip, primarily due to Samsung's manufacturing facilities not being quite up to snuff. So I found that quite surprising because in a way it is really reminiscent of the Tensor chip found on the Pixel 6 in that the phone can get quite toasty even on pretty mundane tasks, including web browsing and watching back videos, not to mention if you are using the camera a lot in addition to doing more serious gaming, then it gets warmer even faster. I wouldn't say it's necessarily crippling, but it definitely gets much warmer than any Snapdragon 855 or 865 phone that we have checked out, which is a little bit ironic because those are older chips perhaps not due to Sharp's fault, but really just unlucky that they chose this particular chip at this point in time. That being said, it's still a powerful processor at the end of the day, and there's absolutely no applications when it comes to even the most demanding of games, whether it's PUBG or Asphalt, that you aren't able to play at pretty much the highest frame rates on this phone. The same thing goes for less demanding apps as well, whether it's any social media app, really any utility app, you can of course install without any problems. So that is more or less it as far as our revisited look at the Sharp Aquos R6. This is really a mixed bag, surprisingly, which I kind of hate to say, because I always like rooting for the underdog that brings something different, fresh to the table, and ultimately competition is what drives innovation. Again, Sharp being a brand that we just don't really see having a super strong global presence in the smartphone space. That being said, despite really strong and interesting hardware functionality, which even in 2023 still seems quite unique, including that extra large under display fingerprint scanner, very good build quality, plentiful RAM, and an excellent hardware for the sensor here, just like on the Leica Lights Phone 1, but unfortunately a lot of that is just a little bit let down, either by software processing and the camera's case that isn't quite mature, fast enough, and consistent enough, and speakers which frankly are a bit subpar despite having a standard headphone jack. So it's a lot of those small contradictions that combines into a bit of a mixed bag. But at the end of the day, I think everything has to put within the context of pricing and also what we can expect in the future. So on that first point, again, if you are able to find one of these devices on the secondhand market, depending on the region that you're in for around $200, then I think many of those shortcomings are much easier to forgive because in that price range, it still is a super competitive camera that takes excellent shots. And again, performance is still very good when it comes to gaming as well as daily usage, feeling super fast and fluid. Not to mention, you're carrying a more unique smartphone that kind of buckles convention or the mainstream of being the Samsungs and the iPhones. That being said, when it comes to point B and looking to the future, I'm also quite optimistic. 
and that is Sharp is still well and alive, making revisions on their smartphones, including the R7 and the R8, which will be available, are all built on similar foundations, but have since slowly improved on some of those software shortcomings. So there's certainly hope that with incremental improvements in later generations, we'll get to a point that becomes super polished and almost faultless even on those levels as well, which would be incredible, even if the R6 is not quite yet there and was really the start of that story. Nonetheless, this was still a very interesting smartphone to take a closer look at. Again, something we don't really see much here in the States and in Europe as well. So thanks for watching this video here at OS Reviews. That's been a closer look at the Sharp Aquos R6 and kind of how it's holding up here in 2000 and 23.